the evolution of cinema so just describes the evolution of cinema and how it's changed yes like uh, he actually uses quite a few key terms throughout uh, the book uh, he refers to like plastics yeah. which sort of uh, over complicates yeah over, over complicates things it uh, talks about sort of the makeup and, and the lighting the artificial lighting on set well he, he likes to talk about uh, the fact that you know Starting off even in the 1920s, really, that uh, different directors had their their beliefs or faiths, as he says, uh, in either image or reality. Yeah, I mean, he uh, he talks about the image, which is like everything that the sort of like the representation of the the screen. So image being like there's there's a reality. So there's what what you see as the audience um, as being fake and reproduced. But then he talks about. Uh, other directors would rather create an image in which sort of like all the plastics involved to create uh, the person as being sort of this sort of big image and you sort of get engrossed by the image as opposed to the reality that it's a film. He then looks at montage and editing, doesn't he? Yeah, I think I think that changed quite a lot. He was saying progressing into well, even from uh, silent films to when they start recording sound montage is quite key into what they're trying to represent really uh, it's all changed all changed along with technology as well the fact that you know we can get so much closer in things yeah uh, he, he actually talks about um, three types of, of montage there's parallel montage and uh, accelerated montage and montage by attraction or attraction by montage yeah, um, and parallel montage is sort of the the usual um, you know uh, trying to display two events sort of happening simultaneously um, and it's sort of used you know quick sort of shots side by side cutaways and then sort of montage by attraction um, was used quite sort of uh, prominently um, in early film uh, especially silent film and it's basically um, talking about sort of reinforcing sort of the memories and sort of ideologies of, of an image um, and it's used in that um, early film with the baby Battleship Potemkin uh, yeah, as well good example. especially the uh, the bit with the baby in the pram going yeah. down the steps and that's obviously been okay. that's influenced like other films think. like the, uh, the Untouchables yeah, well, he talks. Uh, I think the key thing he sort of puts forward is that uh, although technology has changed, and uh, especially with the um, that German director who sort of broke barriers and pioneered the way through with uh, making the camera move, um, with zooming in, sort of the uh, uh, he did it physically, didn't he? So he went with the camera yeah. manually and to zoom in and stuff. That pushed barriers. Uh, in technique and technology, but montage was still the same. Montage was always key in what they created, really, wasn't it? It was sort of key in cinema, and, it and the way it evolved was because of technology. It evolved through, you know, the decisions you can make. So this yeah. parallel thing, the fact that you can show two images at once, um, in some cases, uh, it's all sort of changed the way montage works, and that is how cinema has evolved, really. I'd say uh, he talks a lot towards the end of the book. Um, about the use of depth of field, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, it talks about the fact that, you know, um, those that use depth of field and the creation of depth of field um, with you know, new technologies and new cameras and new lenses. Uh, he, he said that it, that in terms of relating to the image and reality, that the depth of field puts that character in, in depth and helps the audience to relate to that representation and that image created so it eliminates reality eliminates like the reality of what's being filmed 
and helps use the audience to relate to the image created and relate to what's going on. It's, it's used uh, in Citizen Kane mm. uh, with the scene where uh, the child's playing outside and the camera sort of makes its way through into the house whilst another scene is occurring. Yeah. Um, which, you know, is, is quite famous, that scene, for, yeah. for that happening. But I think I th the key analysis and theory he uses is that obviously cinema has changed quite dramatically yeah, in dramatic. many ways uh, through technology, but at the same time it's it's kept the same. It's kept the same um, motives of you know, using uh, montage, using image, using plastics. You know they're all very very s similar key you know parts of cinema, um, but you know create create these good good films. So. At the same time as there's evolution, there's also this sort of underlying theme that he likes to likes to use. Yeah. Do we agree? Do we agree? Yes and, yes and no, really. Um, Quite a lot to take in. Yeah. Um, certainly, technology has evolved to an extent that I mean, look at uh, the original cut for Star Wars: The Phantom Menace, where Yoda it was actually still a puppet. And um, but only a year ago now, when it was released in the Blu-ray version and special edition version, he was actually converted into a CGI Yoda, um, which was used throughout the prequel trilogy. So obviously, technology has evolved so much that it's it's allowing filmmakers to sort of push the boundaries and be able to create these fantastic sort of set yeah. pieces. In terms of cinema, I think I disagree that, um, uh, as you said, the, the evolution of technology has has increased quite rapidly within the past 10, 20 years. Um, but at the same time, I think he's right in saying that cinema hasn't evolved massively. Uh, you've, still got the, you've still seen similar techniques within editing and similar techniques within quite a lot of films prior to the, fan the new Phantom Menace with editing, it definitely has an effect on you as a viewer engaging with the image. Um, but in terms of the editing, I'd say it hasn't massively changed. Um, it's quite, quite similar. It's the same with photography as well. I mean, photography really hasn't changed since the 50s. I'm for a pint with them. No. No, I've got other people on my list first, I'd say. Yeah. Um, he, he's not a very interesting man. No, it's, he's uh, too big a words. Way too big a words. Yeah, you'd have to crack out a dictionary. Yeah, uh, like words or not. Yeah. I'd rather rather keep it simple, keep it funny. Would you? Would you uh, yeah, I, I would actually, I would. <clears throat> Jokes, all jokes aside, uh, I would probably recommend it. Just so you've got an idea. Well, you can debate as well, can't you? Uh, what, yeah. what you think of how it's changed and whether or not it should be changed in the future. I think a lot of up and coming filmmakers need to sort of have that theory, sort of running out of ideas in terms of plot lines. You know, do you move it into keeping those plots but changing things like, why do they always choose to remake good films? Why do they do that? They choose to rip, they find a film that was good and then they remake it again. Spider-Man, remake that, brilliant. Like, why do they choose the films that didn't do too well, remake those and make them better? That's what they should be doing. I suppose, sort of the point really is that there is no originality yeah. in Hollywood. And I would recommend the book to, to media students, I think it has the terminology and, and sort of his ideologies uh, do make sense, yeah. in a way. Yeah. Um, as a sort of exciting piece of literature, no, no, don't read it ever. Read Lord of the Rings or something. Yeah. Just not this. Just, just don't read it before it. bed as well. Yeah, because you will fall asleep. Yeah. Like, out of it. Drink, drink a few coffees. Yeah, just make sure you're on yeah. top of your game. Yeah. Focused. Cool, that's it. So. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that yeah. should be right. And we've got about three minutes.